Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. Everybody, you're very welcome to a new episode of Redefining Cybersecurity here on the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. This is your host, Sean Martin, where I get to talk about all things cyber, uh, typically around how organizations can operationalize cybersecurity in, in their business, not just to, uh, to protect their assets, but perhaps even help them generate more uh, more ass, uh, more growth than revenue, um, which is not always an easy easy feat. Um, not everybody knows what those conversations look like, sound like, end up uh, resulting in in terms of programs. Um, what I found over the years is, and this goes back to some of my days in quality assurance, that if you have a story that people can visualize, then then perhaps they can take action because they can see where the story is going one way or the other and, and their role in, in helping to guide it. And sometimes those stories are technical in nature and other times they're a little more uh, creative. And uh, that's why I have my guest on today, Greg Scott. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me, Sean. Yeah, it's a pl pleasure to meet you. We, we connected on LinkedIn and I, I saw that you have a couple of books and I think another one in the works, if I'm not mistaken. And mm -hmm. I was like, Let's talk about uh, writing about cyber and and uh, and your books in particular. And um, so we're going to get to those. But first, I want to give you a moment to share a few words about yourself. I want and then ultimately, I want to and maybe we start here. Actually, just kind of your 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 entry into technology and, and your journey, sure, into cybersecurity because I think that'll kind of set the stage for us a bit. Sure. Um, technology and I, well, we go way, way. Technology and I go way back, like way back. You know, maybe the very first cybersecurity thing I did was before cybersecurity was even a word. And this is back in high school <laughs> in the 70s. And I, I had, I didn't make, I didn't reflect light off the top of my head in, high, in my high school days. I had a whole, lots of hair. And um, we had a guy here, uh, and I, I live in Minnesota. And we had a, a professor come in from the University of Wisconsin in River Falls, River Falls, Wisconsin. And we had we had our very own ASR 33 teletype, 110 characters per second and, and a um, modem with an acoustic coupler. And just, you know, this goes back a few technology generations. And he came in and he was going to show us all the cool stuff his his CDC cyber computer could do at the University of Wisconsin. So we were all uh, appropriately in awe. And he dialed in and did his thing. And a couple of us got together and we thought, you know, we want to, I want to see some of that stuff for ourselves. So we found a way to disconnect the phone line. So we had to dial in and log in again. And we watched over his shoulder as he tapped in the phone number on the phone. We watched him type in his password and we, we recorded that. <laughs> That's that, funny. Today. You'd go to jail for stuff like that today. But um, we um, so then he left, you know, he left and he did his demo and everybody was appropriately wowed and out. He left and we dialed in ourselves and we logged in as him and and we just started exploring and we found this whole humongous underground market where people bought and sold passwords as as currency. So you could you could you could leverage the password that you have and you can get other people's passwords and other people's credentials and leverage those credentials for others. We, we eventually leveraged our way into the A000 credentials for the, for the, for the Hewlett Packard HP 2000C computer that, that, that our school district shared. And so, and so we, had, we, had, we had high school kids all over the Twin Cities doing this stuff, and nobody, nobody knew about it. It was a whole big underground thing. And so um, 
that was we didn't break anything we didn't damage anything we went through lots and lots of paper printing lots and lots of documentation reading and studying and that's that's the extent of 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 the activity that we did it was a big studying operation for us but today's world that would have been frowned upon and in that world i don't think anybody realized what we were doing or the or the potential consequences so it's a whole different world today <laughs> it, is, it is a different world and, and things have changed uh Oh, yeah, it's yeah. a fine, a fine, a fine line between yeah, discovery and access yeah. and research. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And we did it for the and... right reasons. Other people <laughs> do it for the wrong reasons. Yeah, and exactly. and um, yeah. Then um, there was a time in like um, a right November of two thousand. One of the I'm a I I've been a gravel in the belly do it yourself for for like forever. Back in college, I I taught myself how to change oil in my car. I got oil all over myself. It took me half a day. I'm way better at it now than I was a lot, than I was back then. But one of the things I decided to do for myself was host my own DNS. At the time, in 2000, so this is going back 20 some odd years. So I was I was an adult and didn't have any hair was gone. And in uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, people you pay, you paid money for someone to host your DNS. And I could do it myself for free, just to learn how to do it. So I had my own DNS right here at, in, in, in my basement. And one day my wife came in and she said, Greg, why is the internet so slow? What are you doing? And I said, I don't know. I didn't feel slow. I, I went to looking and I was sending these 60, I was machine gunning these 65,000 byte packets out to some IP address somewhere. And I didn't know where, just some IP address someplace. And I had some buddies at a company I knew called Mission Critical Linux and I called them and they looked at it and they laughed at me. They said, Greg, you fell for the oldest trick in the book. And the, my, I had tried to log into my DNS server and it didn't like my credentials. And then it sent me to a login prompt where I in fact log in. So I, I gave away my DNS, I, I gave away my login credentials, my admin, I root login credentials to that server. And not only did I do that, but somebody had, had, had exploited a known bug with whatever version of bind I was using at the time. And they got inside my name server and they did all kinds of stuff. And it turned out that I was attacking the I was I was part of a DDoS attack, distributed denial of service attack against the country of Brazil. Now <laughs> I had 144 KB IDSL coming into here for internet service. So it's not like I not like the country of Brazil cared about <laughs> my my volume hitting them but that still scared me a lot it made me mad too somebody got inside my stuff inside my house and compromised it and used me to attack somebody else and that that just i felt all the emotions and and then my buddies from mission critical linux said greg you got to call the fbi because if you don't call them and they see that you're doing this attack they're going to come out here and they're, you, they could arrest you for doing this stuff and that I was a lot more naive then than I am now. <laughs> that scared me. So I, in fact, called the FBI on a Tuesday, and I talked to a dispatcher, and the conversation was was like as if I'd called from Mars and somehow spoke English. She didn't know what the Internet was. Now, this is 2000, so it's a long time ago. She didn't know what the Internet was. And I finally had, and she said, do you know who did this to you? And I said, no. Well, how are we supposed to investigate if we don't know? And I said, well, it was over the Internet. It could be somebody from next door. It could be somebody from around the world. You guys do have computer forensics people, don't you? She said, oh, yes, we have. Great. I said, great. I want to talk to one of them. She said, well, they're all busy right now. They can't talk to you. Okay, well, when can they talk to me? Why don't you call back later in the day and then find out? So I got jerked around by the FBI. So I called back later that day. And nobody from that time knew that I'd called back the earlier time. They didn't know who I was, and they totally blew me off. So I wrote this magazine column for a, for a, a magazine called Enterprise Linux, <laughs> Greg's Journey into Learning Linux. That's that's what it was. And so I, I wrote up that episode and how it happened. And the last sentence said, I really hope the FBI would be sharper than that. Three so months at the end. Yeah. Three months go by. The article goes live. It goes out to the world. Now we're February 2001, and I get a phone call from somebody in the Minneapolis FBI office, and they want to come out to my house and troubleshoot with me. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, I'm going to just leave everything sit here yeah. <laughs> just in case you guys decide three months later you might want to call back. And so that 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 was the inciting incident. That's, that's what made me care about cybersecurity right there because somebody penetrated me and made me mad. And yeah. I decided no one was ever going to do that ever again. 
And I've been and so, mostly uh, successful, not a hundred percent, but mostly successful. Yeah. And it's, uh, <clears throat> not everybody's probably running their, even back then is running their own DNS, but, oh, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, a lot I, of people, a lot of people probably think, eh, I'm, su I'm successful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 I've taken on a whole lot more do-it-yourselfer projects, even in the IT world, than most people yeah. would would dream about. So that that part's true. That 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 part's true. So you so you recovered from that? I presume you just wiped it and I wiped it. Yeah, I wiped my name. I, yep, I I get I grabbed all the configuration files, wiped my name servers, rebuilt them, and put them back into production, and learned a valuable lesson about keeping your stuff patched. That might have been lesson <laughs> number one. When patches come out, find out when the patches come out and apply them. You don't just install and set it and forget it. Keep the yeah. keep the patches keep the patches running. It's yeah. amazing how many people out there still haven't learned that lesson. Yeah, individuals certainly, uh, and then companies. I think they they get it. It's just there are far too many to keep up with. For oh yeah, some family. do, some don't. This yeah. is going. This yeah, is probably true. ten years ago. I did some work for a customer, for a small business customer, and it was a Windows server, and it needed, and it, and it was routine patches, and one of the patches didn't want to go in right. Now, don't you hate that when Windows patches don't go in? And, and, it's a, and it's a patch Tuesday, and there's a bazillion patches, and one of them breaks, and so the whole thing just falls apart, and you don't know which one breaks, and so you you put it, you put in half, and if that half works, great, they're done. Now the other half is broken. Put in the other half, and you keep cutting by half. It's kind of like a it's kind of like a binary search, but it's with patches. So I I did that trying to figure out which patch it was, and I probably poured about eight hours into it, and I found the bad patch. The bad patch was because of a font. There was a font. There was some font from somebody that broke this patch, and that just made me crazy. I fixed it, but then the customer, the customer got mad because it was hourly billing, and I'd poured eight hours into getting this patch thing done, and she couldn't. I couldn't. She couldn't. She didn't. Why? Am I, why am I spending all this money for you to do all this playing with computers? You're not. You're not making my business run any better. <clears throat> the server is the same server as it was yesterday as it is today. I. I, I don't want to pay you for that anymore. And I couldn't. I couldn't convince her <laughs> that patching was important and why it was important and all the attackers out there. I, I just yeah. couldn't do it. Yeah. That's, yeah and I'm, by I, the way, I'm in no way like, suggesting that, uh, that the majority of organizations get it. There's no way that's possible. No, that's but, not um, true. They don't get it. And, but yeah. you know what? That's my failure. It's not their failure because they don't know any different. I didn't right. know any different way back in 2000 when I got burned. They don't know any different. I've got to get better at communicating. That's why. Yep. That's that's why I write books. Yep. Yeah, and let's and let's get into that because I, I think, um, yeah. So there's awareness, and then there's doing it, and then then there are problems you have to over overcome. Yeah, I remember yeah. back in the day, um, I was at uh, I was working for EI, and they would the, the the Tuesday of the patches, they would they dig in and and start testing them all, and it would actually help companies figure out which patches were good to, to apply, which ones might need a little extra finesse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and yeah, it was great to do that for a large group. So that work could scale, right? So yeah. your eight yeah. hours, yeah. they spent those eight hours and, and helped many, many, many companies. So it was yeah. pretty cool to be part of that in the early days. So stories to help people understand <laughs> I think that's where you're heading with the, with your book. So what, yeah, tell yeah. us about uh, how that all came to fruition. Which, which book started the whole thing off? Bullseye Breach. This one right here. Bullseye Breach. Uh, there. Bullseye Breach. Oh, the glow. There. All right. Right there. Bullseye Breach, Anatomy of an Electronic Break-In. So that's – that's uh, um, oh, and I have, to, I have to say I'm supposed to – any resemblance to any – any characters in the uh, in the real in the real world is purely coincidental. There's a there's a sentence I'm supposed to say, and I forget the exact words, but you might you might yeah. come to the conclusion. The names have been not, changed, hopefully, to protect the innocent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you might come to the conclusion that bullseye breach, the resemblance, is not purely coincidental. But you'll you'll decide that on your own. There's a in in bullseye breach. There's a this the the big part of the story takes place during the Christmas holiday season in 2013 and there's a minneapolis retailer named bullseye stores <laughs> and they lose 40 million customer credit card numbers to overseas attackers 
in my fictional world, the attackers are from Russia. You may have read about similar attacks where attackers were from a different country, but that's, you know, there's real world and there's fiction. So in my fictional world, the attackers are from Russia and the Russians figure out a way to invade the store across the internet. And they take advantage of a lot of people who are just should know better, who didn't, who, who should know better, but didn't bother. And they, they get inside this network and they pollute all of the point of sale systems with this software that, that collects credit card numbers. And then they, and they offload it to these FTP sites around the U S and then they, then from the FTP sites, they send it back to Russia. And from there, they sell the credit card numbers for, and, and make a, and theoretically make a lot of money. <clears throat> so how does somebody launch an attack like that? And I wanted to explore it. And so I wrote, I was going to write a cybersecurity how-to book because I've accumulated a lot of know-how in my head. And then the more I looked, the more I found out the world is filled full of how-to books. There's some great how-to books out there and they have, they, they're crammed full of information that nobody reads. And when, well, when you go through like the, the CISSP curriculum, the books are like they're like this thick, and they're just as dry as can be. It's it's it, it, yeah. if you, if you ever can't sleep, just get out a CISSP book. <laughs> exactly. Just, just sum through yeah. it. No offense to uh, to Sean, of course. <laughs> oh yeah, no offense to Sean. Sorry, Sean. Yeah. It's not, not this Sean. The other the S H O N Sean Harris. Yeah, yeah. Oh the, oh yeah 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 that yeah yeah yeah. There's some great there's some great writers in there. Super they're, important. They're, yeah. Yeah, they're, yeah, and they're geniuses. They 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 produce great content. But you can't read it cover to cover because it, it just puts you to sleep. And I, I'm not. There's no sense in me trying to reproduce that. It's already there. And I notice that whenever any of those books, there'd be little sidebars with with personal snippets. Those would keep me awake. And I got to thinking, what if, what if, what if we tried some fiction? What if we tried to use fiction to produce to present truth better than the news? And so that's where that's where Bullseye Breach came from. It was going to be a little it was going to be a little snippet that would that would that would talk that would that would complement the how to content. But I never wrote the how to content. I just did the book, just did the, and it turned into a novel. And that, that, that that's how it, that's how it came about. And it, it's it worked. It's a I think it's, it's a pretty good story. It's a pretty good story. You, you meet a lot of personalities and the, the cybersecurity is every bit as much about psychology as it is about technology and you you gotta you gotta get a feel for the personalities and, and a feel for both and a feel for why people make this make decisions the way they make decisions yep. and a lot so of times talk, talk to me a bit about that because this is an interesting point so i you, before we started recording you noted that i had a little it was a four-part series i think is the one you were referring to that i wrote a little a town got uh got ransomware and there are four different three different stores and and different stories for each one yeah yeah and, yeah and how do they respond and I'm, and I'm a tech guy i'm an ops guy i'm a program guy everything looks like a project to me and there's an a to z and you have to figure out how to get there safely and and mm -hmm. uh, on budget and uh, mitigate risk and then run through ambiguity and that, that, that's all tech stuff in my head so that's how i think and yeah, yeah as i was yeah. putting these together and, I, and that's why i want to get your perspective uh, i actually took a moment to figure out okay well who who are the people behind these companies and what are their companies about how do they run their company mm -hmm. how does that how do those things relate how do they engage with their customers how does the the the, the society view them which may have an impact on how they do things as well. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about the. It all fits. It's all part of the same big puzzle, isn't it? It all yeah. fits. So tell, yeah. tell me about yeah. how, how you approach that in, in putting your story together. And, um, and this goes back from lots and lots and lots of firsthand experience with, with people and stories and stuff. And um, so I, I invented these characters in Bullseye Breach that, that acted and thought the way that 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 many of the of the customers that I'd met thought and acted. Um, and one one time one uh, one real world real world story real world story. I sat in front of a small bank and I was pitching. Let's do a let's do a an audit. Let's just look at look over your stuff and see how secure you are. You're a bank, you know. It, it would be good if you knew whether or not people were getting inside your account and your 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 system and doing stuff. 
And I talked to this bank vice president and, and, he, and he looked at me and he said, well, you know, we've already done that, Greg. Would you like to see the results of the audit? <laughs> it's like, that's like, duh, of course. What, there's, no, there's no answer to that question other than yes. So I said, yes. He said, well, let me go get it. And he went and got it and he brought me back to this manila folder. And I sat across the table from the desk from him and I thumbed through the folder and looked through it and looked through it and looked through it and looked through it. I finally, looked, I finally looked up and I said, you know, this is great. They did a great job evaluating your website. Where's the part of this report where they talked about your network right here in the bank? I floored the guy. I floored him. Mm. He, I floored him. <clears throat> he sat back and he looked at me and said, and then he said, Greg, thanks for coming in. I appreciate your time. And let me just show you right out here to the door. <laughs> Never talked to him ever again after that. Mm. And you know, I, I, I laugh, but I should be crying for that. Story. Yeah, I know. It's willful ignorance. It, mm. There's no other word for it. It's it's like I really want to. I just I want to be stupid because it's technology, and so only smart people do technology. They wear white lab coats and stuff, and, and that's not me. I don't do technology. I don't know anything. And so if I don't know anything, then it can't hurt me. And it's like it's just it's it's you know we've seen this psychology since before I was born. And, and it, it plays out, it plays out in businesses across the world every single day. And that's why we keep getting penetrated. And it, yeah, we, we want to laugh, but you also want to cry. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. And what happened is a lot of these managers, they don't like technology. I, I talked to one guy at a trade show and, and I couldn't figure out, I had this trade show booth of all the cool IT stuff I could do. And you, you see people flow like, you know, like water, they'd flow. And they'd see my booth and they'd, they'd turn and they'd go across the other side of the aisle and like that and like that. So they wouldn't have to get close and talk to me. I finally had enough. I went out in the middle of the aisle and just stood there and I captured the next person that came by. And I said, what's wrong? Why do you hate my guts? What's wrong with my what's wrong with here? He said, I don't hate your guts. <clears throat> he said, I just I, I don't hate you personally. I hate technology. It's a necessary evil. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. It changes all the time. and It's just a rat race. I don't want to think about it. That was that's the attitude of so many people. So IT is not an asset. It's an expense. And what do we do with expenses on our and our and our spreadsheets and stuff, we minimize expenses. We don't maximize the value of our expenses because they're expenses. We maximize the value of our assets. If you want to speak business speak, but this stuff, it's they're not assets; they're expenses. So we we do the least we can do to get to get done the the the, the stuff that we have to get done that we used to be able to do without any computers at all, with pieces of paper and pencils and erasers and stuff. Now we have to have all these expensive computers to do the same stuff we've always done for the last two hundred years. That's the attitude, and we you, you, until until you change that attitude, nothing else, nothing good happens. So who who changes that? I mean, we might be off off script a little bit. Not that there's ever a script in these conversations. <laughs> who changes the attitude? Because <laughs> I I mean, uh, well, I mean you're, you're you're deep in the in the Linux world, right? You're, you're I am now. You, yeah, 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 yeah. You're I mean the the stuff you're working on, you can share it if you like. But the stuff you're working on. It's probably everywhere. <laughs> I know yeah. it is everywhere. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, so those those are assets. The people working on what you bring to market view their stuff as assets. <laughs> well, you'd think so. Like people who yeah. are running so tell me, tell me what, huge tell me data centers. Right or wrong. Yeah. Uh, you'd think so. A lot of times, a lot of times in the big industrial computer business world, they're still expenses. They're just more zeros than in the small business world. <laughs> a lot of times that's true. A lot of times, not always, but a lot of times that's true. Don't, yeah, don't, don't make, don't make generalizations based on scale. Cause I've seen, I've seen, I've seen this, I've seen in depth small, I've got lots of small business stories and I've seen some of the big business stories now too. And they, they, they think similarly. And the big business side, there's a whole bunch of liability exposure and like boards of directors, if boards of directors some have liability for some of these things that happen. What was the the, the, the second book and what was the, the driver? Well, the second, for... book, the second yeah. book is Virus Bomb, Virus Bomb right here. And the second book, that's where where culture on a bigger scale meets technology. So there's a there's a bald headed IT guy named Jerry Barkley. And, and Jerry Barkley is the main character in Bullseye Breach, too. They're both two novels from the same fictional world. They're independent novels. One reference, the virus bomb references Bullseye Breach, but it's a standalone book. You don't, you don't need one to read the other. 
And Jerry finds finds this cyber attack at a small marketing company um, in the Twin Cities. <clears throat> and that turns out to be related to another attack against a transportation company. And that turns out to be a, a tailored attack specific to that company. And then he, he turns, he, he learns that he learns through, with help from an antivirus company, he learns that this attack, somebody somebody has tra has taken the, remember Stuxnet? Somebody took the Stuxnet code, the, the stuff that attacked Ira the Iranians and messed up their nuclear centrifuges. Somebody took that code and modified it to attack every transportation company in the US. And they did that to find out what stuff was shipping from where to where. So then the attackers use that, use that knowledge to take a shipment of industrial explosives and blow up a mine in northern Minnesota and murder 30 people. Big deal. I mean, that's 30 people are dead, but that's not going to change the whole world or anything like that. But now they have they have these industrial explosives that they can do stuff with because they they only they only used half of it to murder all those people. They have a whole bunch more. So now what are they going to do with it? Well, they use that to launch another attack, but that attack is also a diversion against the real attack to catch to to um, steal a virus sample from a Ebola that's plaguing the world at that at that time. And then I use that to blame it on 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 another player to try to induce to try to persuade the U.S. into starting World War III with the wrong people. And then if that if that all works the way they want it to work, well, then millions of people will die. And the U.S. will the U.S. will get in big, big, big trouble. So Jerry Barkley sniffs all this out. Of course, nobody believes him because Jerry Jerry's not any former government agent or anything. He's just he's just an IT contractor that lives in Minnesota and doesn't have any hair on top of his head. And so he calls the FBI, and the FBI doesn't believe him. And and the FBI dispatcher he talks to thinks Jerry is threatening to do all this bad stuff. So the police come and arrest him, and <clears throat> he spends a few hours in jail until they figure out that he's not threatening, he's trying to warn, but by then it's almost too late. And then and then we save the world. That's a really good story. It's a really it good, a good story. story. Yeah. It's a good story. Yeah. And I yeah. think uh, there's probably a lot in there that, I mean, because it seems like maybe you gave away the ending, but uh, I, I No, I didn't give away the ending. Well, all of, right, course, of, we course, of course the good guy wins. The good guy wins and all, yeah. you know, and all good. But yeah. I, there's you know, a, the there's, there is a, there's some humor behind that one too. I, um, I was I was well, I live here in, in the Twin Cities and hmm. we're right I'm I'm I live ten miles from the Mall of America. And that's like the biggest shopping mall in the whole United States. It still is. And um I was casing <coughs> casing there's parking ramps underneath the hotel in front on the south side and on the north side on the north side of the mall. And I was casing the parking lot on the north side of the mall just for my own novel writing purposes. <laughs> And I'm walking up and down the aisles and looking for security cameras in the ceiling and and just trying to trying to figure out what's what. And how, if I were going to park a van and blow stuff up, where would I park a van? And just and just looking over questions like that. <laughs> okay, it's novel research. If you're if if you're with if you're with a government agency and you're monitoring my internet movements, <laughs> but a couple things. First of all, everybody in your department is a professional, and all the good-looking professional people in your department. You need to buy copies of these two books for everyone in your department right away. Say, so I work in a commercial here. You need to buy and <laughs> study these books because these are my manifestos to take over the world. <laughs> but so <laughs> when you do novel research, you just get into weird stuff. So I'm casing the parking ramp back and forth, and this lady comes out. And she says, "Can I help you?" And I said, "Oh no, that's okay. I'm just, I'm just, just, just walking around." And then I made my huge mistake. I'll never make this mistake again. I said, "We're going to blow this place up." <laughs> And she, and she, she oh, you got this looking like that. And she backed up a few steps. And I went, oh crap! Wait, wait, wait! No, it's in a book. I'm not. I'm not really gonna. I just. It's in a book. I'm a writer. It's in a book. <laughs> that didn't. Uh, that didn't make her happy. She didn't no. want to write up. And probably didn't. Probably didn't happy. ease her mind at all. <laughs> no, <laughs> didn't. Didn't bring her back at all. Uh, I. I so finished casing the place, and I and I walked away really, really, really quick before the police came and took me away into a rubber room somewhere. <laughs> so what um i presume you have some feedback from from folks that uh have read this what what do they say do they, they do like they like, they like the story is, is yeah. there yeah i know when um 
I know when movies are made, a lot of people are quick, especially in our our uh, community. Mm-hmm. People people are quick to say, "Yeah, but th- that's not really how that." works <laughs> oh yeah um yeah i've got blog posts about hollywood hackers yeah. i i have i have plenty to say about hollywood hackers and this is something i'm proud of you will never see any fake hollywood hacker scene in any book that i write that that's just that ain't gonna happen that's a promise because i i i i don't like to see that I, that fake technology stuff doesn't do anybody any good and and it and it fosters a whole bunch of attitudes out there that are just wrong about how technology works. <laughs> if you want to find out about somebody, you don't just go hack into the DMV and click a couple buttons and find everything about your target. It just it just doesn't work that way. There was a there's a um, there was a thriller. I, I like to read thriller books, and there was a thriller novel by an author I won't name here because I'm going to badmouth him. And and he wrote and, and part of the story is his attacker pulls into a parking ramp with an SUV and he's got, and and then from, from inside this SUV, he gloms onto this hotel's Wi-Fi, and, and somehow does that. <clears throat> and then he finds the, the thing that does video and he gloms onto that video and he records a little bit of it so that, so that he can play the video back in a loop so he can have a secret meeting and no one can see that he has a secret meeting later. He does that in about two hours time with no prior recon and no prior knowledge of what kind of a video system it has. And, and then the author manages to to misuse the term access point in, in the, in the whole story. And you know, the more I read that, the madder I got, because just, you know, do your homework. You're going to write technology books, just do the basics of homework. There's plenty of people that will, that will tell that will answer the questions you want answered. Don't try to just make stuff up when you don't know what you're talking about. Cause you just destroy your credibility. So anyway, you, sorry, you got me way off on a tangent on that. <laughs> well, I, I think, and I'm going to, I'm going to bring it back full circle to uh, what I think a lot of my listeners would care about. Uh, a lot mm-hmm. of, a lot of my audience are, practitioners and security leaders and executives that uh, have peers that they're trying to convince that this stuff is important and and Mm -hmm. how it not only as i mentioned in the beginning not just protects revenue but maybe could help even generate yeah uh value in the organization um those a lot of those people don't understand it right and if Yeah, I guess the point is we we need to be accurate, but we also need to have a good story, and mm-hmm. and they they both have to be good, right? I'll give you yeah, I'll give you some stuff <laughs> you can use both in fiction, from right. fiction, and from the real world. So from fiction, from fiction, bullseye breach, from fiction, mm-hmm. the CEO of this company lost his job. So did the CIO. So did a whole bunch of managers, and this company lost millions of dollars in lawsuits and stuff. That mirrors the real world. When when um, when OP, the Office of Personnel Management, the the the, the U.S. government HR agency, yeah, OPM, Kathleen OPM. Archuleta had to resign in disgrace because she let all she let the Chinese penetrate her agency and everybody who got security clearances. Now the Chinese know as much as it, everything that they fill out on their forums. The Chinese know about it. Imagine, <clears throat> imagine in the now in the real world in the real world. Imagine that you fill out a, a bunch of a bunch of you put a bunch of information on your security clearance form and you send that to the government because the government's going to keep it safe. Right. It's security. It's secret. But they don't keep it safe. The Chinese get to get to it. And now you're helping a Christian organization distribute Bibles in communist China. How many people do you think will die because the Chinese know who you are and why you're there and what you're doing? And they're not going to kill you because you're an American citizen and that's an act of war. And then and we launch nuclear bombs and stuff like that. So they're not going to kill you, but they're going to kill everybody that you associate with. People die. People die because of this stuff. But forget that. Nobody loses money because people die. So in the in the retail world, retailers lose millions because of attacks like this. Home Depot 2015, Home Depot lost 54 million credit card numbers to real attackers. Target lost 40 million credit card numbers to real attackers. <clears throat> they both lost millions. To the, the consequences to Target were more secure, more, more severe than the consequences to Home Depot because Home Depot wasn't the first major one. But the managers at Home Depot, when, when the people on, at the grassroots tried to warn the managers, the manager said, no, we sell hammers. We're not tech. No, we sell hammers. That's what we do. So they ignored it. 
and to that was that was to their detriment that they ignored it. And then, um, and so then, and so then we make this make make the stakes a little bit higher in this world. If 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 you don't think if I can if I can walk through the Mall of America and I can walk up and down and case a parking ramp and figure out where to park a cargo van filled with electronics to blow the place up, if I can do that. What do you think people who who are good at this kind of stuff can do? I mean, come on, come on, people. <clears throat> and then cyber attacks. I've talked to so many people that 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 just are just willfully ignorant about all this cyber attack stuff. It's just all it is is just characters flying across a screen. It's characters and pictures on a computer screen. It doesn't mean anything, but it does. It does mean stuff. In my fictional world, my fictional world. 500, almost 600 people died when those hotels blew up. Plus, dozens of people died when the when the mines in northern Minnesota blew up, and millions could have died because of World War III because some people figured out a way to take advantage of willful ignorance to 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 pull that attack off. If you read this book, this attack, this attack really could happen. I did I did a lot of homework. It's not that's not just it's not just it's not James Bond. This is this is real world kind of stuff. And enjoy the fiction. Enjoy the fiction. Right. Use the education. Yep. Yep. I like that. Uh, I like what you what you say there at the end. Enjoy the fiction. Use the education. That's our whole, yep. uh, that's whole how you purpose with mind. this. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's how you change. Get, the, that's how you change minds. Get them to read the fiction. Yep. yep. And then they think, holy moly, this could really happen to me. This this whole scenario makes sense. This could really happen. What are we going to do about this? There you go. That's the reaction yeah, I want. A step, a step at a time. Exactly. Yeah. Read, read, yeah. read it first. Take action. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you work for a government agency and you're watching me, tell everybody. <laughs> and not because it's not because it's Greg's manifesto to take over the world, because but because it's important fiction. Yeah. Ho hopefully, hopefully people are listening and uh, and thinking differently here. Yeah. And Greg, I mean, your your passion uh, is, is super clear and. Uh, yeah, congratulations on those two books. I know you have a third one in the work, trafficking, trafficking you. Trafficking when that you. One comes, yeah, yeah. When that I'll one give comes you out, we can. On. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give you ten seconds on that one. <clears throat> that one's searching for a publishing solution. I'm, I'm. Well, we'll see. I'm, I, I'm, I'm. <laughs> well, court. Another day goes by, so I'm closer to finding a solution than I was a day before. But um, and and trafficking you. Jerry Barkley is not the main character in trafficking you. It's still in the same. It's in the same fictional world. Jesse Johnson is a is a principal fraud analyst with a major bank in Minneapolis, and she um, she, she runs into a young Native American and somebody uh, who a Native American who's a sex trafficking victim, and so um, Jesse goes through a lot of trouble to try to rescue Leilani, my 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 victim, and she pays for it with her career, almost pays for it with her life. And then she finds out a whole lot of stuff about this about this trafficking industry that that nobody that nobody's aware nobody really knew 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 about. And it turns out in the real world in the real world trafficking most of it happens over the internet. There's a huge technology angle around this. You can't you can't trust anybody who says you, we we've heard all this about trust before with social media and things like that. But I I wanted to I wanted to write a book about how the consequences of that work in the in the in the CISSP ivory tower <clears throat> we care about the confidentiality integrity and availability of data you know the CIA triad that's your memory aid CIA okay and we spend a lot of time on confidentiality that's where data breaches and ransomware and that kind of stuff comes in business operations that's where that comes in we need to spend more time on integrity in the social media world, we violate the integrity of messages all the time because anybody can can impersonate anybody. You don't need an ID to sign up for a Facebook account. You just make an account and you can be anybody you want to be and get a fake picture from somebody and there you are. There's, there's your profile. You're, we're violating the integrity of messaging there. That's how it that's that's the that's the framework around how it fits with the cybersecurity world. We need to pay more attention to that and we don't. And so <clears throat> There's that hypothetical. There's that hypothetical ivory tower framework, and there's gut wrenching consequences in the real world for how that stuff happens. I've got, and I made a video about that. If I were, if I were an attacker, if I were an online predator, how would I do it? 
And the way I would do it is the same. I'd probe wide, and then when I find a potential, probe deep. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> and so I and I so I spent I spent <clears throat> about five minutes looking at Facebook profiles, and I found one from somebody who appeared to be vulnerable. And then I hypothesized for how I would how I would probe deep into that into that person's profile to to launch an attack. And I've I've got a video of I made a video about it. It's the creepiest video I'll ever make ever. I, it's the creepiest video I've ever made. Hopefully, the creepiest video I will ever make. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, <laughs> it's a uh, it's a it's a shitty topic. Um, and That's and uh, a very 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 sad. Reality. I've been there's a conference in Ireland called uh, IrisCon, and they often have folks in from Interpol. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I was there one year where they, they talked about this and the use of technology to yeah. enable. It's an industry. Right? I mean, that's what it is. It is. And, it is. and, and it's more uh, than by the way. It's just messed up. Yeah, it is. There in here in Minneapolis, <clears throat> right here in the Twin Cities. Going back a few years, um, I think it was 18 young men, young men um, became victims of online persuasion and flew to Syria. Some flew to Syria, some flew to Somalia, and they some joined ISIS, some joined terrorist organizations to fight against the U.S. because they because somebody persuaded them over social media that they could get involved in something bigger than themselves. And there's a book, a nonfiction book called In the Skin of a Jihadist by Anna Arell. That's not her real name. And she impersonated a vulnerable young woman in France. And she got and, and she regularly um, traded video, like real time video, like what you and I are doing right now. She real time video with with some ISIS kingpin. <clears throat> and that got really, really, really hairy. That novel that you just you, it's not a novel. Sorry, that that story just um it, it it i couldn't put it down i couldn't put it down I, it, it's and now anna Arell that she can't use her real name anymore because real really 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 bad terrorists are after her and she lives in france she's a lot closer to them than we are here in the u.s so yeah this this stuff this stuff is really real and it's got real consequences that yep. uh, that we need to consider a lot more than we have yep well greg it's been uh it's been great chatting with you and uh, congrats on the two books and uh, uh, best wishes that the uh, the days don't tick too much longer and, and you get your third one out. And, yeah, uh, thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, yeah. website plug, www.dgregscott.com. D as in Daniel, dgregscott.com. And that's find out I've got tons of content there. Help yourself yep. and leave, leave comments, too, so that yep. you know I, I, I enjoy the dialogue. Perfect. All right, Greg. Well, thanks very much. We'll put that link in the in the show notes as well, so everybody can can grab it from there. All right, cool. And uh, speaking, of everybody grabbing stuff from the show notes. Uh, I want to thank you all for listening and watching uh, today's episode. Hopefully, it's uh, it's made you think a bit, and I, I think a lot of a lot of the audience here kind of already get the importance. Um, I think the takeaway I would I would encourage you to to embrace is how storytelling can help you achieve what you're really trying yeah. to achieve in this role. I mean, we all, we all care about the same thing, which is helping, helping customers be safe, helping society be safe. You um, betcha. Stories, stories help with that. So thanks. Uh, thanks again, Greg. Thanks everybody. Uh, be sure to, to subscribe and share and uh, we'll see you all on the next one. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you learned something new and this story made you think, then share ITSP Magazine with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our columns. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.